Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, for the millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. If you are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, you can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic. That's according to the CDC's website and their information on when you've been fully vaccinated. You've no doubt already heard the news, so it's not breaking from the state of us. But today we want to take an opportunity to look at three very important things as we talk about taking off masks. One, what's the situation? What specifically is the CDC saying? I think this is something that maybe hasn't been covered as in depth as we'd like it to be or as clearly as we'd like it to be. And we have linked on our website the information, but we're going to dive into it in the first segment. We'll also look at what are the implications of requiring people to get vaccinated? Is this something that we should do? If we do it, what are the obstacles? And then, of course, also, what do we do with the people that don't want to get vaccinated, right? They're not vaccinated and they don't want to because there's the teetering group and then there's the group that's already decided we don't want this. So there's a lot to talk about, a lot to get through in today's episode, but of course, a conversation on COVID-19 and how we go about taking off masks would not be complete without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years, here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Um, I mean, I find this very, very fascinating as someone who has been fully vaccinated. I do have some concerns, though. Um I've said all along that I think we need to follow the science, and I've been very adamant about that. I'm not sure what the science is here. My concern is that as people, okay, the CDC says if you're vaccinated, here's what you can do. What's going to stop those people who are not vaccinated, which are almost 50% of the country uh, at this point, um, from going ahead and saying, yeah, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway. And the numbers, the science shows us that cases are higher right now than they were a year ago at this time. And we were all worried about things. So I'm afraid a little bit of the mixed message that it's sending. I think everybody's going to take advantage of these guidelines to get back to life because they're tired of what was going on. And I just wonder what the ramifications of all of that will be. So within the optimism of the report, Your friendly redneck liberal is a little skeptical about how this all might work out. But here's our word for the day. Yours truly is now a sexagenarian. Emphasis on the sexagenarian. I am a sexagenarian. It is someone who is 60 years old or between the ages of 60 and 70. So for the next decade, yours truly is a sexagenarian. Okay. All right. (laughs) Uh, I'm not sure how much we'll be able to weave that into today's episode, but uh, well, we it's fascinating. Sex, we sexagenarians <laughs> are worried about what's going to happen to our world. Okay, fair, fair. So looking at the guidance specifically, uh, and for those of you that would like to look at it for yourselves, or you know that we're big about doing that, go to thestateofus.org. We've put provided the link to the CDC's website. This is a, I mean, I don't know what you think, Lance. This is a very fast read. When we printed it out, it's two pages, okay? And most of that is bulleted with very adequate spacing. And there's a couple key components, okay? Have you been fully vaccinated? Because this is, right, if we're going to talk about what you can do when you've been fully vaccinated, you need to understand, do I count as somebody that's been fully vaccinated? This one's pretty straightforward. In general, people are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after their second dose in a two-dose series, so that'd be like the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, or two weeks after a single-dose vaccine like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So basically two weeks after you've been vaccinated, right, against COVID in most situations, you are considered fully vaccinated as long as you've received the second dose if it's a two-dose vaccine. So what can you start to do? Because that's what we're all interested in, right? Well, here's the here's the bulleted points from the CDC. You can resume activities that you did prior to the pandemic. You can resume activities without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart, except where required 
by federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial rules and regulations, including local businesses and workplace guidance. So basically, the CDC is saying here, you can follow our guidelines, assuming that there are no other guidelines that say something different. But here are here's what we're providing you guidance for in situations where you don't have guidance. Um, obviously, the other, I think, motive here, right, is to provide new guidance and direction for all of those entities that was just mentioned to make their own decisions about what they're going to enforce, which generally speaking for folks that don't know, that's been 90 percent of pandemic regulation anyway, is the CDC says X, Y, Z, and then the states and local municipalities decide how to act on Mm -hmm. that guidance. Um, If you travel in the United States, you don't need to get tested before or after travel or self-quarantine after travel. Okay, so that's uh, domestic travel, right? You do need to pay close attention to the situation at your international destination before traveling outside the United States. And there's some specific things there about what to do with international travel, under what circumstances you might need to quarantine and get tested. We're not going to go over those all in detail. You can read them for yourself if that applies to you. And last, certainly not least, if you've been around someone who has COVID-19, you do not need to stay away from other people or get tested unless you have symptoms. However, if you live or work in a correctional or detention facility or a homeless shelter and are around someone who has COVID-19, you should still get tested even if you don't have symptoms. Now, you might say, well, why wasn't healthcare mentioned there? That's because in this piece, Lance, there's this big disclaimer that says all of this that we're mentioning does not apply to healthcare institutions. So yeah. it's important to note that, right? This is not, oh, I can walk into a hospital now without a mask. Nope. Can't do that. Okay. Am I reading something into this? Because it says you don't need, if you come in contact with someone, you know, contact tracing or whatever, you find out that someone you've come in contact with, um, at a restaurant or a party or a get together or whatever, um, contracts COVID. You don't have to get tested unless you have symptoms. So they're saying, so it's okay, you know, to go ahead and come in contact with these people. Um, but if you get sick, then get tested. If they glossed over something there, because there are still those of us, and this was going to be later and maybe we'll get into it in the next segment of the show. But what about those people? Okay, so we've got a shot, but we're still in a high risk group if we get COVID, but you're telling us we don't have to wear a mask or practice social distancing because we've gotten our, we're fully vaccinated. Do you understand where I'm going here? It seems like a little bit of a, a gloss over point here. It's like, oh, you don't have to worry. Cause I can, I can see people reading this and saying, oh, look, it says here, you know, friendly redneck Nick liberal, you got your shot. So you can be around all of us now. Let's just go ahead, you know, and totally miss the point that, well, unless you get symptoms, meaning, well, and again, I know there's some science out there that it's a very small chance that you can get it, even if you've been vaccinated or do you not get it at all? But it seems to be a gloss over here. It's like, well, you don't have to worry about it. Well, unless you get symptoms. Most of the vaccines are... 90 more 90 percent or more effective at preventing um symptomatic right mm-hmm. symptomatic infection and most of them are 86 percent or more effective at, pre- at preventing asymptomatic infection so i think but here's the caveat right is then there's this section right after that that says what you should keep doing right um you still need to follow guidance at your workplace and local businesses which we just talked about If you travel, you still should take steps to protect yourself and others. You will still be required to wear a mask on planes, buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation traveling into, within, or out of the United States. And it goes on about transportation hubs, et cetera. Um, You should still watch out for symptoms of COVID-19, especially if you've been around someone who is sick. If you have symptoms, you should get tested and stay home and away from others. And the last... But certainly not least, people who have a condition or are taking medication that weaken the immune system should talk to their health care provider to discuss their activities. They may 
need to keep all precautions to prevent COVID-19. Geez, Lance, that sounds like something we've been saying, like the whole pandemic is if you have questions, if you're not sure, you should probably talk to who? Your healthcare provider, your medical well, professional. Which is what I've done. And right. he continued, he told me to continue. He said, don't worry about what the rules are. You need to continue to, to mask, mask in public and try to stay out of inside places as much as possible and or where there is a mass gathering outside. He said, you know, you want to do any activity outside? You know, you know, and I coach a little bit and, you know, coach some soccer and some different outdoor activities. He said, do all you want. But he said, coaching an indoor sport or going to uh, an outdoor concert or an outdoor sporting event with a large group of people, you might want to still stay away from it until we get more people vaccinated. And so that's what he said, you know, and I understand that. But but he said as well that the cases, and I know you've mentioned this, are grossly underreported right now. That, you know, nobody wants to, there's not a big push on testing. Nobody wants to collect the data. Nobody wants to report the data because that might slow down the economy. Well, so. and, and some of that too, because I think all of that's true, but some of it too is right. All these people that have probably had COVID that don't, they don't know they've had COVID because they never got symptoms in the first place. So they never even thought I need to, even if, even if they don't like testing or even if they do like testing, right? It's, well, I, I never got any symptoms. I was never ill. I never went and got tested because I didn't think I had it. So that's one of the problems, right? Right. Is then the numbers indicate that, you know, somewhere around, you know, what, 30 million people or so have had, you know, have been, have tested positive at one point or another for COVID, so like 10% of the population, right? Well, if you add that to our vaccinated group, it takes you maybe closer to 60%. The problem is we have, we don't have any real data on the people that definitely got it and either knew they got it and didn't get tested or, right, they never knew they had it in the first place. And that could be, maybe that's not as big a portion as we think it might be, but that's definitely out there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's important that we just all are at least keeping that in mind. So at the end of the day, and I told Lance this, I think when it came out, we both said, basically, the biggest change, right, is that it's now easier from the CDC to list the things, before it was easier to list the things that you could do, harder to list the things that... uh you shouldn't do because there was a lot of things you shouldn't do. And now it's basically the opposite, right? It's um, most things they're saying, if if you've been fully vaccinated, right? Big caveat there. Um, you can go back and start doing again. The question is, and this is what we were talking about coming up, right? Is what about all these people that aren't vaccinated? Because it's great, right? This, I mean, this lovely news for the people that are vaccinated. This is, you know, exciting and a move in the right direction. What about everybody else? Uh what about requiring vaccinations and what do we do with people that aren't vaccinated? Those are things that we still need to talk about. Keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. So you've been fully vaccinated. You're not in a high risk group. You talk to your doctor and they say, hey, you're good to go. It's gravy, baby. Go, go do your thing. Well, great, great. What about all those people, half of the population, uh, that hasn't been vaccinated? <laughs> well, they're saying, great, now I'm just going to yeah. go and do whatever I want and because I'm going to tell everybody I'm vaccinated or say, hey, look, I, I missed it. Am I being too cynical? But that's what I think they're going to do. Uh, one of the things we've talked about a good bit, Lance, right, is not necessarily on the air, but the challenge of... Um, what do you do about, because there's, there's kind of two segments of people that haven't been vaccinated, right? Three segments, I guess, in trying to be fair. There's the people that just really haven't gotten around to it. It's, they have no particular aversion to getting vaccinated. They're, they just haven't been in a big hurry, right? And that's probably the, the tiniest portion. It, this is not a scientific, uh, you know, estimation here. This is just my personal guess. That's probably the tiniest portion of these three groups. So that group that's, you know, yeah, I get it, you know, at some point, but I'm not, I'm just not in a big hurry. I just, you know, or, you know, busy single parent working a bunch of jobs. It's lower 
on the list of priorities because they're not in an age group that's high risk. So that group, right? Next group, the teetering group, right? The group that's like, well, I don't know. I, you know, I was kind, I'm kind of unsure about the vaccine. I, I'm not sure if I feel that it's safe or that if I need it or whatever their hesitation might be, right? They have hesit, they have reservations about getting it. So they haven't gotten it yet. And then you've got the last group, right? Which is that group that has decided I'm not getting the vaccine. Um, and so there's different questions there about how do you get them to where they're going to get it? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, Lance, because I think that that, that is in front of, right, that question about requiring vaccinations, because we can require vaccinations for stuff and there's that side of it, but how do you convince people, um, to go get it? If why, as long as we're not requiring it, right. Cause we're not at the moment. What are we going to do uh, to convince people? I think there's room for those first two groups. I don't know about that last group because you and I talked about that some, right? And I mean, Trump got his vaccine. He told people they should get vaccinated. I'm sure some of them did. But what about the ones that didn't? Yeah. And, and I don't. And, you know, here's where you got to tell us, right? I mean, let us know you are listening to the show and you've got an opinion here. Because this one's got me flummoxed. I, I don't I don't get it. But, you know, send us an email at podcast at the state of us dot org podcast at the state of us dot org. Because I don't have the answer because I understand why people I get the psychological why people like Donald Trump as the president and that they followed what he said and, and they hung on every word and did what he wanted. Him. I, I understand how psychologically people get that way. Um he has now said, gotten his own shot after he had COVID, right? I mean, he had a positive test. He was sick. Had COVID, got tested, <laughs> recovered. <laughs> and still went and got the shot because that's the other one I hear out there is, well, I had it, so I don't need to get a shot. Okay. But the president did and then went out and said, okay, you need to get the shot. And his followers were saying, yeah, we're not going to get the shot. That's the part that doesn't make sense to me. Because now all of a sudden that psychological following of, of an individual isn't playing out. So now why is it that you don't want to do this? Because it's like, well, you know, well, well, what? It's free. It's not costing you money. It's not. And if you do this, then we can all go back to doing our things. I can travel freely and help industry, help the entertainment industry. I can, I can go on cruises. I can travel and stay at a holiday and express. I can do all the things that I want to do. If everybody is, let's go take 15 minutes and get a shot for free. And yet we have 30% of society who says, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, I'm but, not going to do that. Right. Because, well, it's this, that, or any other. And they have, you know, 10 different reasons. And while I'm trying to be respectful, I am trying to be respectful of differences of opinions. On this one, I'm really at a loss, Justin. I really am. Because nobody wants to get back to life before COVID than I do. Sure. Well, and that's, we we talked, just, I think, full disclosure to the audience, um, we had been talking about doing an episode about what's next for COVID, what's after COVID, right? For, I mean, like over a month now. And we've been waiting because it's, you know, well, something's going to happen. Things keep evolving. Surely we're going to get something new. And finally, last week, we decided, okay, you know, there's nothing new and we just got to do it because we've been putting it off. So we do the episode, right? And this is an episode you've never heard and are never going to hear because literally, right, after recording the episode, CDC releases you know, the new guidance. And then of course, subsequently, um, you know, companies are releasing information. So I think part of the point there is that, you know, it continues to be an evolving situation. Um, and so we, we have to keep following that and we have to keep trying to stay up to date with it. Um, and I know that's been one of the hard things for everybody, but part of what we noted in that episode, to your point was, I don't think there's anybody out there, right, vaccinated or otherwise, that's like, oh, yes, I'm eager for COVID to continue, right? I mean, I who? Show me. You know, I, I, I don't care what side you're on or what side you're thinking about. I think everybody, if given the option, right, of, you know, 
no COVID or COVID. I think everybody would pretty much choose no COVID because it sucks. I mean, there's a lot of things about it that nobody likes, right? So and, and not the least of which is that, you know, we've we've lost hundreds of thousands of people uh, to it. I mean, not the least of which, right? I mean, probably the most and, important And all component. of the loved ones that are still around that have been affected by that. And we yeah. haven't even gotten into, and we're not, and it's not today's episode, but folks, I may not be around, but what's going to be the long-term effect on our healthcare system for all these people that survived it? Because I know that a couple of friends who have had it, who are now back and up and operating, thank goodness, you know, they, they, they recovered, but they're doing imaging tests on their lungs and they have scar tissue that they didn't have before. Okay. What's going to happen to them as they get older? You know, because it's like, I don't, is, is it like smoking does to some people, you know, smoking cigarettes and that kind of thing. But how's, what health symptoms and health problems are they going to have in the long term? You know, cause they're 30 somethings or 40 somethings now, but they now have scar tissue on their lungs that they didn't have before they contracted COVID. And will that continue to get worse? Will it stay the same? Will it cause them problems in the future? We don't know. Right. And that, and that's people of, um, you know, all ages. Yes, for most, uh, you can get it, recover from it, and it's probably not a huge deal. But we don't, there's a lot that we don't know. And I think that probably is the biggest, it, it shouldn't be, right? I think that the biggest argument should be that if you're in one of those healthy groups, you do it because you don't want to uh, negatively affect other people who aren't in those healthy groups. And you want them to be able to return. But don't you want to take care of yourself too? To normal. Well, what I'm saying, <sighs> that's at the end of the day, that should that's probably the main driving factor, I guess, is to take care of yourself. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was as simple as, you know, we know this is going to save other people's lives, so therefore, go get it done. I may not need it, right? I, I It may not be, quote unquote, necessary for me to get it, um, but I'm going to get it because I care about protecting people in my country who would also like to return to normal. Because to Lance's point, you know, people that, that aren't re- quote unquote returned to normal yet, which is many, 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 many people, most of us, right? They don't want COVID to continue. They don't like it continuing. They want to go back to quote unquote normal, right? So, but the only way that part of the only way that they get to do that is getting to the other side of cases being uh, a very manageable level and deaths being negligible. You know, that's the only way. And the best way to get to that point is uh, for people to get vaccinated. So, and it protects you, right? So I, to your point, I don't know uh, what we, what we can do for those folks that are no, right? I think there's on the teetering group and on the group that just hasn't, you know, found time. I think we're already seeing things being done to get those groups to do it, you know, and they may not be as fast as we want, but as long as they are doing it, that's important. You know, I mean, for the people that truly don't have the time, you've seen employers that are giving people, you know, you can have time off, go get it, come back to work. Not a big deal, you know? Um, And for people that are uncertain, I think the more Americans that continue to get it, right, and the ongoing evidence that there's no no downside really to getting it, um, all of that helps them be comfortable enough, hopefully, to get it. Um, that other group, it's hard to know exactly how how large of a percentage that is. You hope that it's, you know, 20% or less because then it's kind of like, well, we don't need you. You know I mean? We want you to get vaccinated, but we don't need you to get vaccinated. So, I mean, it's just scary when you see what's going on in Brazil and in India, <clears throat> where people would love to have the vaccine and they don't have it. We have it. And 50% of our country is saying, yeah, I'm not really interested. I, it's just, I mean, anecdotally here in Ohio, we're down to the daily rate of people getting vaccinated to the point that it's going to take about six weeks to raise the average another 10%. So what about requiring people to get vaccinated? Because, you know, you're listening. It's like, well, that seems to be the answer is just everybody gets vaccinated, right? I mean, we just jobs every place. They just require it. Um, well, we're going to talk about that. Why, why might that be an issue? Um, and is it is it the, you know, the best approach? 
Um, those are all things we need to talk about. But we'd like to hear from you. You've been listening to us. Where are you at? You know, what are you doing? Uh, have you been vaccinated? If you haven't, are you going to get vaccinated? If you're not, why? You know, what? Uh, and, and also, if you haven't been vaccinated yet and you're planning to, why haven't you been vaccinated yet? And that's not accusatory. I'm genuinely curious. You know, what has what has stopped you, I guess, from doing it or what has come in between you and getting it done? So, um, and if you're one of those people that's, you know, I'm not getting it, uh, why? Why are you not getting it? Um, we'd like to know because maybe you can help us better understand uh, that side of things. So more to talk about requiring people to get vaccinated. Keep it here on The State of Us and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. If you've been vaccinated, there's lots of good news to be had. And uh, we talked about what about the groups that haven't been vaccinated? Kind of said, I think there's three areas there that comprise the people that haven't been vaccinated. Um, But I think, you know, one of the biggest motivators, right, is the return to normalcy, or it should be. The problem, Lance, is, is you and I have discussed a lot of that 50% already returned to normal, right? So getting the vaccine is not really a big motivator because it's like, well, what do you mean? I, you know, I'm already doing X, Y, Z. Right. So I'm already I, eating out in public. I'm shopping without a mask. I'm running around doing my own thing, hanging out with my friends, going to parties, going to ball games, going to concerts and right. as they reappear and going to the movies. And so what do you mean? I don't have to get a vaccine because my life's already back to normal. So, so we require vaccines uh, for all kinds of stuff, Lance, right? I mean, if you're going to be a teacher, you're going to send your kids to school. There are certain vaccines that we expect society to mm-hmm. have. If you're going to work in healthcare, right? Some colleges require vaccines, you mm-hmm. know, certain vaccines sure. before they'll allow you on the campus. Education, healthcare are some of the primary examples of institutions, right, that require those. Well, we require, uh, employers require drug tests. I know it's not a vaccine, but they're, if you start talking about privacy rules, right? There are places where you want to get employed that expect you to take a drug test. So if your argument's a privacy issue, it's there's a plethora of things out there that you either have to do some kind of testing or get a vaccine, which all fall under that big umbrella of, well, it's an invasion of my privacy. It's an invasion of my rights. And here's, I shared, because you had posed the question, Lance, right? Why or what would stand in the way of doing this? Why aren't more people doing this? Yeah, we, I mean, that's what I don't I don't get. Like I said, you know, well, it's my right. It's like, wait a minute. We have all kinds of things where, you know, we make requirements. And it's like, well, you can't require me to wear a mask. Well, I require you to wear pants and a shirt and shoes to come into the restaurant to eat. They have signs on there, right? No shirt, no shoes, no, no service. service. Yep. Well, but, you know, that's different. How's that different? But we don't allow public nudity, right? We say, well, we have, well, we have decency laws. Well, what happens to my, to my right? You know, where's, where's my right to dress and appear in public as I want to? So don't give me this. I don't understand the argument of you're invading my right to do something. We, we invade people's rights all the time as a government and as a society. You do have the right to not get vaccinated. Now, do you have the right to not get vaccinated and not follow what other institutions that you voluntarily participate in require? No. You know, I mean, that's and that's the distinction that's not getting made. Right. You don't want to get a vaccine. Okay, you can't work here. Well, that didn't you still have the right to not get nobody's forcing you. You know, you can go work someplace else that they don't require that. It's not like there's not a lot of jobs out there. And I know that's upsetting because people, well, I don't want to leave my job. Okay, well, but your job requires you know, that you show up at a certain time, that you do certain things, that you wear clothes, often re- requires that you wear a certain type of clothes, right? Not just that you have clothes on, but that- Or there's you, safety gear that mm-hmm, you're required that you must to wear. wear. Um, so the point, I guess, that's being made there is we could talk about whether or not all of those things are good and that it's okay for companies to do all that. But then we talk about it holistically, right? Not this one thing, because to Lance's point, 
it's in all of these different areas of life already. And that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a good thing to perpetuate because that could be discussed separately. But to say that we don't do that with other stuff is just not true. I mean, we do Which it Which is why I don't day. understand not making it a requirement. And this, we've had this discussion. And so to simplify it, that's the background information on why I don't understand why there's this hesitancy to make it a requirement. And what I told Lance was, I think the biggest obstacle that a lot of companies, organizations are nervous about is this is an emergency use authorization, right? All of these other things, these vaccines that are required have full FDA approval, you know? And so they look at it as they have a little bit more legal standing. I think especially some of the early stuff, we're seeing some companies now that are getting more comfortable with it is their concern was, okay, it's emergency use. So what if we discover side effects, right, that we didn't know about? And then as a company, I required somebody to get it and they sue me because I made them get something, right? And it caused these problems. So they want me to pay for those problems as a result and for their pain and suffering. That, I think, is going to be the legal issue they run into because they're going to say, look, you know, the FDA, the FDA, right, if I'm suing a company because I had some kind of side effect from the vaccine that they made me get, I'm going to say, look, it had emergency use authorization. They couldn't tell us definitively, you know, that it was completely safe. And now I'm ill because you made me get something that's experimental. You know, that's. Again, we can pick apart that argument, but that's the argument, right? The legal argument that would be made against those companies. I think part of what's changing is you have over 100 million Americans that have received the vaccine, right? And so the the case group continues to grow. The body of evidence suggesting that there is no real inherent risk to most of the vaccines and the very few risks that exist are so remote even more remote than some of the side effects on the drugs that are regularly approved for use. Right. That the body of evidence is shifting toward a, a place where I think you're going to have more and more organizations that are comfortable taking that step. Well, if you watch shows and watch regular commercials, to your point, the drugs out there that they say, well, you know, you do this for diabetes, you do this for heart disease, you do this, you do this. The side effects are worse than the illness that you have. You know, so, I mean, every drug, every thing has a side effect. And so I guess I'm then I understood your point. I understand your argument. Then let's get the FDA to waive the emergency part of this. So, okay, we have enough evidence now and this is what we need to do. Because if that were to happen, is there is there another argument, Justin? I mean, I, you came up with that one for me and I gave you, okay, <clears throat> I patted you on the back and said, yeah, I, I get your point there if I'm an owner of a business where that might cause an issue. Okay, once the FDA takes away that roadblock, what stops us from requiring it? As As, like you said, for a job or for... You know, I mean, it's like we're discussing me having to go get a new driver's license. Right. And if I want to fly on an airplane, I have to get, I have to jump through all these hoops to get a special license or to get a passport for even domestic flights. That's not infringing on my privacy, infringing on my rights. You're going to make it. I just want to buy an airplane ticket. I got the money. Let me get on. No, you have to have a special driver's license or you have to have a passport. Even if I want to fly from Columbus, Ohio to Los Angeles, California, I never leave the country. And now there's a stipulation on what I have to have to travel within my own country. Yep. <laughs> and it's the law. And nobody's yep. crying and complaining about that. Well, <laughs> <clears throat> well, I am. No, I was, I was about but, to say. Yeah, but people are doing it anyway, right? Because right. Because, because they want to fly. Yes. Because they want because they want to be safe. And this is a way that we've put a layer of protection in to protect people from terrorist activity. Okay. Again, to my point, well, I mean, I'm gonna do this, but I'm not gonna do this. I just I think the other thing that it comes down to, and you all at home let us know, we'll leave it on this note. It comes down to that. We want to at least be under the illusion that we still have some degree of choice. 
And that's a bigger separate episode, but it's the whole thing. Um, you look up some of the data. Why do people drive five miles over the speed limit, right? Uh, and interestingly, a lot of that data suggests it's not because they actually think they're going to get someplace substantially faster. It's because they like saying to the government, you can't tell me what to do, right? And unfortunately, I if you're out there and you truly don't ever do that, and I'm not talking about the speeding thing, but you never just break a rule just a little bit just to prove that you don't have to do it. You know, I don't care if it's the government, your employer, whoever, right? If you're a young person listening and your parents have rules, we've all done that, okay? Because we all like, ah, I'm in control, you know, I'm in control, which as we've just discussed, we all probably have to get a little bit more comfortable accepting the fact that we're not in a lot of ways in a lot of situations. So you don't want to get the COVID vaccine. Okay. Here's the things you can't do because you made the choice not to get it. Right. So, and that's some of those distinctions I don't think are getting made about. Yeah, no, you, you know, I, I'm fine with people not getting it. Am I okay with the people not getting it doing X, Y, and Z in public spaces that endanger other people? No, I'm not okay with that. You know, you don't want to get it. Okay. You want to stay at your house and you don't want to. Okay. I mean, fine. You know, that, that doesn't hurt me any. And I think people on this show know that's what Lance and I are all about. You should have the right to make your own decisions as long as it doesn't unfairly endanger other people, right? Exactly. Exactly. And that's why Lance and I have talked some about the seatbelt thing being an issue, you know, because that is an example of a law that is primarily for your benefit, not the benefit of protecting public interest, right? So things like that are interesting debate points for us. Um, Let us know your thoughts. Send us an email, podcast at thestateofus.org. Lance, what were we trying to do with today's conversation? Well, I mean, hopefully we've raised some some issues for you folks because that was our, our point. But uh, here at True Chat, we, we try to do that every time we go on the air because our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And we've had one of those today. And we've probably pushed a few buttons out there, but that's the point because we want these conversations to take place because that's how things get better. And so if you have this conversation with us and you've listened to it and you share it with others and they want to know where they can listen to these honest, open and respectful conversations, because let's face it, folks, they're few and far between these days. Um, tell them you can find our show on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and everywhere podcasts are found. And I think Lance and I are both just to end with, we're very excited about hopefully the beginning of the end, but the way we all get there faster, folks, is if you all do your part, right? And if you have questions, ask them, but ask them to medical professionals, please, not the internet. Go seek real professional advice from people that you trust. The book of face is not a doctor. That's right. Um, The State of Us is a syndicated radio program and a podcast. New episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays by 4 a.m. Eastern time for the podcast and in select talk markets on the weekends. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to our producer, Bradley Butch, and thank you all, our audience, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in, thestateofus.org.